Welcome to Leading the Next Generation with Tim Elmore, where our mission is to empower the emerging generations with skills to lead in real life. Hey, podcast listeners, Andrew here, and you are in for a treat today. We are honored today to be joined by a longtime friend of Growing Leaders, Dr. Gene Twingy. Dr. Twingy is a professor of psychology at San Diego State University and is the author of several books that we have cited and referenced, as well as several ref- uh, papers and other things that we've referenced here on this podcast. But her latest book is what she's here to talk about today. It's called Generations, The Real Differences Between Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X, Boomers, and the Silent Generation. Dr. Twingy is here to share some of her latest research and insights with us. I think you are really going to love this conversation. So take it away, Tim. Gene, I always enjoy time with you. Um, I hope you enjoy it a little bit. I enjoy it a lot. We've done some events together, podcasts together, interviews together. Thanks again for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. So I want to talk about generations. You've written on this, and um, and I have followed you for years. You're just a long distance mentor. So um, you've written on the me generation, I gen. Um, how? Why? Why did you feel like I probably ought to write something on all the generations that are mixing it up today in the workplace? You know, it was just the realization that technology is having an impact on all of us. Yeah. And that this was just really a turning point time for us to try to understand all six living American generations, how they're working together, how they're similar, how they're different. Um, There's so much attention in the media to generations and it's all fun to read, but you know, sometimes there's some myths out there and some stereotypes out there and we have it's the age of big data. You know, we have so much data now to dig through and that's my expertise is to try to really dig into this big survey data and find out what are the real differences. And so that was my goal in this book. Yeah, that's good. Well, and what I love is you do bring research to the table, not just, Oh, those lazy slackers, you know, or those fragile snowflakes or whatever. There is something to every generation. And I think you and I agree, they all make a contribution. Uh, to the world, and it's going to be a little different. So, so let's jump in. Um, what have you found to be some of the major differences, not stereotypes, but differences mm-hmm. as you look at the data on these five generations? Maybe just walk us through what you found. Yeah, yeah, I'll do just a little bit on each one. So I okay. begin with the silent generation, mm-hmm. those born 1925 to 1945. So they were actually the leaders of the civil rights movement and the feminist movement. It's yeah. often assumed that was boomers, but it was really yeah. silent. So they're, yeah. even though that was a generation that married young and had their kids young, that's kind of how they got their name. It's really yes. a misnomer of yeah. a name, yeah. Yeah. really. Um, so the boomers, um, that's probably the generation a lot of people know the most about, yeah. um, born 1946 to 1964. So obviously known for... Uh, taking those changes that the silent generation started and really running with them in terms of equality, uh, known for individualism. Um, They've also in the last few years gotten known for, oh, they're all the rich and powerful ones. Mm -hmm. Well, not all of them. And that's that's a stereotype. That's a, a misperception. There's a lot of boomers, especially those who didn't get a college education, yeah. who saw the economy kind of change out from under them and are not in a great place. And yeah. that has to be recognized too. No doubt. Yeah. Good. Um, so then we have Gen X. So that happens to be my generation. Yeah. So we are the middle child of yeah. generations. Um, not only that we have two uh, younger generations of, of adults under us and two older um, yeah. than us, but also because we always get forgotten. Um, yeah. We actually kind of like it that way, kind of flying under the radar. <laughs> it's um, what most people my age say. So Gen X, you know, X is the letter for an unknown quantity. Yeah. So yeah. we're kind of hard to define. But I, I, I found in the analyses for this a couple things. So first, Gen Xers like known for ha- like being known for being tough and having mm-hmm. life experience. Yeah. Yeah. We think a lot of the debates around um, free speech and cancel culture, the breaking point tends to be between Gen X and millennials, even though those are two generations that often have a, yeah. a lot of other things in common. And Gen X was, was um, 
unfortunately, really as teens and young adults experience the decline of trust and trust yeah. in others and trust in institutions yeah. um, in, in the country that we're still grappling with today. Um, so then we have millennials. So millennials born 1980 to 1994. And they are a group known for their self-confidence and optimism, at least when they were young, although that's yeah. crumbled a little bit as yeah. they've grown to adulthood. Yeah. Even though, contrary to popular belief, they've done very, very well economically. So there's this idea, oh, yeah. going to be the first generation to do as well as their parents. Yeah. They've actually done really well. Their median incomes are actually very high, even when corrected for inflation. So yeah. that's one stereotype that isn't, isn't quite right. Um, yeah. And they've also been um, a real juggernaut politically, and that will probably continue to be yeah. the case. Yeah. Um, so then we have Generation Z. So I called them iGen in yeah. my book. Um, iGen uh, came out in 2017. So this group um, is known for a number of things. But the, things that, the thing that concerns me the most is the huge increase in depression, which yeah. started with teens, then extended to young adults. Yeah. And this generation is still really struggling with that. Um, they have a lot of strengths as yeah. well, um, and I think it'll be very interesting in the workplace and, you know, it's already interesting education to watch this group because they are very interested in helping others. Yeah. That's one of their big strengths. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of college faculty, including myself, have noticed that they're, um, they're just, they're very nice people, and they are very interested in, in um, being helpful. Yeah. And... Um, contributing to society and making things better. Yeah. So I think it's going to be very interesting to watch over the next few years, the dynamic between that impulse mm -hmm. and then the pessimism that many of them have. So yeah. We can take that pessimism and say, okay, I'm going to see the things that I don't like and we're going to go change it. That could be very positive. Mm -hmm. However, if it becomes nihilism, and yeah, everything is just right. terrible and we can't do anything about yeah. it, that could be a more negative outcome. Yeah, yeah. All the energy is deflated from the, from the balloon, yeah. Let me ask you a question. This is totally off the record. Um, you mentioned some of the similarities between millennials and Xers. Um, do you see some similarities um, in the stuff going on as they grew up between Gen X and Gen Z or iGen? Mm -hmm. A little bit. I mean, okay. so with, with, with Gen X and millennials, what they have in common is individualism. Yeah. So those are two yeah. generations that came after the boomers that kind of took for granted yeah. um, equality based on gender and race and sexual orientation. And they yeah. also kind of took for granted the idea that we should all feel good about themselves, which, mm -hmm. you know, has some advantages, but also does yeah. have some yeah. downsides if it's not based on anything. Yeah. Um, the, those two generations are really exposed to a lot of that. So Gen yeah. Xers often have Gen Z children. Yeah, yeah. And so there, there, there's some disconnects um, for a lot of Gen Xers. You know, they listen to their Gen Z kids talk about gender and sexual orientation using terms that they have no idea what they're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one disconnect. Um, but there's, you know, there are some similarities. I mean, I think, you know, Gen Xers were young during a time of pessimism as well. Mm -hmm. The early 1990s when the generation got its name. Yeah. And so I think sometimes Gen Xers and Gen Z kids can find that common ground um, yeah. around that experience. Yeah. That's just been my anecdotal observation as I did focus groups with X and Z. There was that individualism and both of them can say, yeah, I was a little skeptical too when I was growing up. Because mm -hmm. there was a trust issue, among other things, that led to that. I'm not just buying in and trusting a leader without showing some credibility. Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. Here's a question I'd love to ask you that's also off the record. You can take the fifth if you want to. But I, I know you'll have something to say. If you were to talk to an employer and you were to say to her or him, here are the contributions I think you can count on from the silence, the boomers, the Xers. Mm -hmm. Walk down the five and say... Mm -hmm. Again, without stereotype, I know you're so careful not to stereotype, but what would be some of the major contributions you think are in each one? Well, I mean, we, so I do, yeah, I want to, I want to go back to the, to the data that we have. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, there's one survey that I draw from and it looks at uh, high school seniors. So 18 year olds and asks about different work attitudes. And, you know, although that is a point in time, it has a strength that it takes age out of the equation. So you're not comparing, you know, 60-year-olds to 18-year-olds in yeah, terms of yeah. their work ethic. You know, you can yeah. look at 
18 year old's work ethic yes. you know, at back in time. So it's not perfect, but it, 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 it has some strength to it. Yeah. If you look at that, what you would say for the silence and the boomers is it is true work ethic that they're yeah. more likely to say, yeah, I'm willing to work overtime, that yeah. it's really yeah. important to work hard at a job. You know, that was, that's a core value, mm. you know, for those two generations. Yeah. Um, and for Gen X, it's, that's where it starts mixing it up a little bit more, mm -hmm. you know, in yeah. terms of, um, work-life balance. And then that really accelerates from, for millennials where I think yeah. that it hit, that hit its, its yeah. peak. Yeah. Um, so that's what, you know, it, you can consider that a strength depending on your perspective that millennials will, will push back on, you know, the idea that you have to work so many hours that they can find a better balance. Um, Gen X sometimes does the same. Um, Gen X is often good at mediating between boomers mm -hmm. and millennials. Yeah. You know, they can take a little bit of the perspective of both. As the um, middle child. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's yeah. right. You know, they have some of that, some of that resilience and toughness. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, a lot of Gen Xers talk about that. Um, and then, you know, Gen Z, I think they're, they're wanting to help. Mm -hmm. is a really, yeah. really key thing that yeah. managers should yeah. know about and, yeah. you know, realize that that's a, a huge strength yeah. in this generation. Yeah. And so early they learn the world needs help, don't they? Yes. Um, yeah. I remember reading one global study. I don't know if it's true in the U.S., but I think it's true globally. Gen Z sees um, we need to step up and lead. Now, it's not a power trip to them. They don't want any power trips, but they want to serve and make the world better. And I think we need to capitalize on that. That's good. Yeah. yeah. So here's a question, Gene. Um, what do you do when you get pushback on, is this generation thing really a thing? Mm -hmm. I mean, you and I both absolutely love the sociology to it all. But I mean, I hear some people, oh, isn't it just teens are teens and, you know, this, that, mm -hmm. and the other. What do, you, what do you say? I'm sure you're practical yeah. in your response. Yeah, well, you know, one thing is just that how much evidence we have. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, and this isn't older people, you know, observing something about teens. This is what teens and young adults say about themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking at. And that's not stereotyping. That's yeah. listening. That's right. That's what like we need that. to be doing, yeah. you know? Right. So I think that's, that's one important piece of it. You know, and the other then... A lot of the other stuff around generations um, it is challenging. Say, should we group people at all? You know, what about the birth year cutoffs? Aren't they arbitrary? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think what's interesting about that is it's really what people are arguing about is the details, not the big picture. Yeah. Because we can pretty yeah. much all yeah. agree that yeah. cultures change. Yep. We can all agree that's had an impact on how people live their lives. I think we can even all agree that, you know, culture being different now than 100 or 50 years ago has had an impact on values. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. You know, we all agree on that. That's the big yeah. stuff. Yeah. And then it's just, okay, should we, where should we put the birth year cutoffs? Aren't they arbitrary? Sure. Yeah, yeah. But I think what's also sometimes ignored in that argument is that we group people using arbitrary criteria all the time. Yeah. And it's not it's just about generations. Yeah. We do it for age groups. We talk yeah. about teenagers. Yeah. 13 year olds to 19 year olds. Well, 13 year olds and 19 year olds are pretty different. Yeah. Just to say somebody born in 1980 might be different from somebody born in 1994, but we group them together to do analyses, to understand, yeah. to just have the language yeah. to be able to talk ab uh, about these things in any kind of informed way. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all we're doing with generations. So I think yeah. when, when people make those arguments, I think they sometimes forget that these challenges and issues are not unique to yes. studying generations. Yeah, that's good. You're right. Do you ever use the term microgeneration to describe subsets within a larger? Because change does happen fast, even within a generation. Yeah, it sure does. I mean, that's one reason why in the book, um, most of the graphs are line graphs that show all the years. Mm -hmm. So I have yeah. a few where I've grouped people, but I do think it's important to consider the changes that happen over the course of a generation as well. So there, there's absolutely some truth to the idea of micro generations. It's just from an analysis point of view, yeah. and this gets a little in the weeds, but yeah. you know, if you are looking at people say, you know, born in 1990 versus 1991, usually you're not gonna be looking at as, as many people, your differences are gonna be smaller. You yeah. know, 
it, it's just going to be harder to really come to any conclusions, which yeah. are at all helpful if you're cutting too finely, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. Um, talk to me about this. What do leaders need to know to lead younger generations well today? And maybe we just take iGen for now. What would you say? There's a young 22-year-old just out of college, ready to start their career. What would you tell the manager? Yeah. So, I mean, we do always have to give the caveat that, you know, what we're talking <laughs> about is based on averages yes, and not everybody right. is yes. going to be the same. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as a general rule, I mean, I, I think the first place to start and I, knew, I know you always start here, too, is with empathy and perspective yeah. taking. Yeah. This is somebody who did not grow up in the same time right. that you did. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of things that you can't take for granted, you know, based on that. So um, I, I think it's just it's important to try to understand that perspective. And I'll, I'll mention just, a, a, you know, a couple of things. So okay. one is um, one trend that uh, I spend a lot of time on in, in the book, which um, I think is really helpful for understanding the perspective across generations is the speed of development has slowed down. Mm. And this is something that sometimes gets criticism, sometimes it gets praise, but really, you know, it's just kind of the way it is Yeah. that because people live longer now, mm -hmm. people take longer to grow up. Yeah. So kids are less independent. Teens are less likely to have their driver's license or have a paid job or drink alcohol when they're yeah. in high school. Yeah. Yeah. Young adults take longer to uh, get married and have kids and settle yeah. into a career. Yeah. And middle-aged people, too, look and feel younger than their yeah. parents or yes. grandparents it's did so at the true. same age, right? So it's across all of the generations. It's not just something yeah. know, affecting this one. But what that means when you're thinking about that 22-year-old mm -hmm. is they have probably not had as much experience. Yeah with independence, with decision-making. And again, there's going to be variation. There's, there's, yeah. there's going to be exceptions, but you, you probably can expect them to be a little closer to their parents, a little yeah. more uncertain yeah. of themselves, yeah. just not as sure about mm -hmm. how to do things on their own. So you have to give them more careful instruction. Yes. Yeah. So I see this with my, my university students yeah, a lot. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, it's the detailed instructions. Tell me what I need to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Some of this is from the changes in education as yeah. well. We've been very prescriptive, haven't we? We have. Yeah. yeah. And that didn't always help them own their decisions. Yeah. I'm sorry right. about cutting in. No, no, exactly. But, you know, just with the way we, you know, education has restructured in the last couple of decades, it's, it has become much more about, um, you know, carefully here's here's exactly what we need to do and then we need yeah. to pass the test yeah. you know there yeah. just hasn't been as much yeah. um opportunity for that independent decision making and then that comes up in that developmental way too just the things they do in their leisure time out of the house that they're just like less likely to have had that time independent in solving problems yeah. so i hear this from from student affairs folks at universities on a regular basis yeah. you know they'll say i have more and more students who can't make even simple decisions without yeah. texting their parents yeah yeah it's interesting well i love the fact um that you brought up empathy i so believe that we do we want to build grit absolutely but we need to start with empathy and stepping into their shoes or asking them what it feels like to be yeah. in their shoes. And then I think they go on the journey with us. That's good. Yeah. A um, couple more questions. What were some of the big surprises as you looked, as you kind of did the meta analysis mm -hmm. on the data that, that you would, that might be fun for listeners to hear? Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of it did, you know, follow where I expected it to go. Yeah. Um, the, the piece of, of millennials doing so well economically was was very surprising, mm -hmm. given yeah. um, how much I had read. And I, th I yeah. think that happened because I think a lot of the perception and data and things that got quoted were outdated. They were mm -hmm. things from yeah. 2014 when millennials hadn't quite had enough opportunity yeah. to recover from the Great Recession, which did hit them hard. So I think some of that is just, just that perception got stuck at a certain yeah. point in time. And when you look at the data that's more updated, mm -hmm. it's, it's a really, really yeah. different picture. Um, so I think that that's probably the thing from the book that, that might surprise people the most. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of some of the other, some of the, you know, I, I think the, the other thing that was somewhat surprising to me and just looking at the big picture was, you know, I had become, of course, with, with um, iGen very focused on technology in terms mm -hmm. of 
smartphones and social yeah. media yeah. and how many of those effects have, have been negative. But stepping back and taking the bigger picture for the impact mm -hmm. of technology across all of the generations, across all of the decades and, and centuries, yeah. you know, realizing technology is a net positive. Yeah. Yes. The way that we live our lives um, due to technological progress is better. I mean, I think it's just, it, it's, it's, it, it has freed us from drudgery on a day-to-day -day basis, and it has given us longer lives because of better medical care, which is sure. due to, you know, that's yeah. a form of technology as well. Um, and it was that, that, just that, that realization of that, that bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And that also, I think, challenges something else that's really common in the narrative right now, which is to say things are terrible. This is the yeah. worst time to live. If yeah. you spend yeah. time on social media, this is the impression that you get yeah. that everything yeah. is horrible. Yeah. You know, some of that, again, you know, is the way social media works. <laughs> but I think, yeah. I think there's, there's polls suggesting, um, say from the Pew Center recently, a lot of people are very pessimistic right now. And that can be positive. It means people look for a way to change things, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. in a productive way. But it's a, it's a little bit of a mystery why people are so dissatisfied yeah, yeah. right now. And so that's, that's something I haven't really completely figured out yeah. the answer to yeah. yet. You know, and my swipe at that, you didn't ask for it, but my, my swipe at that Go is for it. totally anecdotal. But I just think because social media is so prevalent, we're comparing ourselves yes. to somebody's best vacation ever. Exactly. You know, and ours is a good life, but we're doing the laundry today, you know, rather than right. the best vacation ever. So, right. And but, I worked at it. Yeah, no, no I, I have to. Laundry is one of my obsessions with the thing with technology. So I have to say something really quick on that. Okay, so you're doing the laundry today and you're not on the best vacation ever. But imagine if it was 200 years ago. Do you know what you would have to do to do laundry? Mm -hmm. You would have to boil water over, yeah. over an open fire and it yeah. would probably take you all day yeah. to do your laundry. Yeah. Instead of throwing it in and going and watching television or whatever you do. This is called yeah. perspective taking, isn't That's it? That's right. <laughs> That's right. And it doesn't mean we don't have problems now. I'm not That's suggesting right. that. I want to of be clear. Yeah. You know, we definitely have challenges that we need to solve um, yeah. as, as a world, as a culture. Um, but that perspective taking can be really helpful. It can. You're so right. Gene, this is always rich, but um, I want to just ask you one last question to give you a chance to talk about anything you might have missed. Um, I love how you have helped many of us, including me, understand the two-hour mark on social media, the vulnerability we have. To, I, just talk to our listeners. Uh, any last words of advice for them to lead young people well? Yeah, so technology is a net positive. Yes. But what are we going to do with this extra yeah. time yeah. that technology has given us? Yeah. Do we really want to spend all of that time on social media right. or on screens? Do we yeah. really want our kids to do that? Yeah. Is that really productive? Um, so I, I just um, wrote, I have a new sub stack and I was just writing about this, mm -hmm. about the incredible amount of time that teens spend on social media. Yeah. Three hours a day on average. Yeah. Yeah. Um, about 22% of 10th grade girls spend seven or more hours a day on social media. Uh, Isn't that incredible? Yeah. So you think about the ways that they could be spending that time otherwise. Um, and, you know, one way is spending time with their friends in person. Yeah. So yeah. we got to think about that as parents. You know, that's yeah. actually not a waste of time for kids mm -hmm. to be with each right. other in person. We do worry about them, but... It is good for their mental health. It's good for yeah. their social skills. You That's know, right. It's just so much better for their yeah. mental health and just everything else Yeah. Um, than, than scrolling through social media. So a couple practical things. So my f number one rule is no phones in the bedroom overnight. That's for your teens. It's also yeah. for adults and parents. Yes. It's just you're yes. going to get a better night's sleep. Uh, if at right. all possible, you get those devices out, yeah. out of the bedroom. Um, if you have younger kids, put off getting them a smartphone for as long as possible. Get them a flip phone, yeah. get them a gab phone yeah. or some other phone where they can just call yeah. and text and maybe take yeah. pictures and that's it. Um, and then in, if you can, put off having your kids get social media until about 16. 
Yeah. I think that's better. I actually support a national policy. Yeah. Some lawmakers are working on that's this good. to raise the, raise the minimum yeah. age to 16 because sure there are some potential benefits to social media, but for kids, there's a lot more dangers. Yeah, that's the right. The dangers, the harm tends to yeah. outweigh the benefits. Yeah. yeah. Particularly for kids and, and younger teens. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you're about that. And I love the work you and Jonathan Haidt have been doing recently. I'm, I'm a recipient of that. So, Gene, thank you for carving out time. I always love spending time with you. Um, you're a good teacher, you're a good mom, um, and I wish you the very best and I look forward to the next time we get to talk. Thank you. Always great to talk to you as well. Thanks. Wow, what an incredible conversation. If you enjoyed that like I did, I know you'll probably want to dig deeper. So if you want to find out more information about our guests today, check the show notes for more information about how you can stay in touch with what they're up to. Well, as always, if you would rate this podcast, give us five stars on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. We would greatly appreciate it. If you found this episode particularly helpful, share it with a friend. We would also appreciate that. If you want to stay connected with us online, we are at Growing Leaders and at Tim Elmore pretty much everywhere you are. And then finally, if you have ideas for this podcast, maybe other people you think we should interview or subjects you think we should cover, shoot us an email. It's podcast at growingleaders.com. Thanks. Thanks.